it wasn't until the 1940s that actually people thought that um, someone's behaviour or someone's well-being could change as the result of an intervention. So uh, very, uh, uh, the story is often told of these large uh, psychiatric units in North America um, and uh, people with enduring mental health difficulties were written off that nothing would change, that this was a given. Um, and then they realized that actually, uh, we wouldn't do it now, but if they withheld cigarettes, their behavior changed. And that was the beginning of behavioral intervention uh, in healthcare. And, um, and that, that did great things. Uh, and I think most importantly, uh, altered our understanding in this part of the world um, in relation to uh, the human condition, that things can change. And then, as you know, um, in the kind of 60s and early 70s, uh, people began to think, well, okay, you know, it's not just behavior, and um, it's actually something to do with how people think. So uh, cognitive behavioral therapy was born. So uh, we moved from behavior uh, to uh, thinking. So uh, the understanding that how we think um, might, in fact, uh, cause us to suffer. Um, and you know that there was, there's been 30 years or more, 40 years of research uh, that provides, um, some people would say, very good support for CBT. Um, it absolutely has its limitations. Um, anyway, that's a slightly uh, different issue. I guess in the last kind of 15 years, uh, what's now referred to as third wave intervention has come. So it's gone from behavior, cognition, and now what's being referred to as third wave. And third wave intervention is uh, where uh, what uh, kind of a lot of the mindfulness and acceptance and commitment based therapies uh, fall under. So um, we've gone from uh, thinking, okay, yeah, behavior can bring about change, cognition can bring about change, but actually maybe there's something else altogether that we need to do differently. And that's really important because it involves a, quite a paradigm shift in terms of how we think about human suffering that maybe it can't be changed, and maybe it's something more to do with how we relate to our suffering and our cognition. So that's some of the context that, that, that I, I've been kind of working with for the last 10, 15 years, uh, I suppose academically and clinically. Um, we, we've, uh, as you, some people will know, recently, just this year, had our first intake on the Masters in Mindfulness, Mindfulness-based interventions in UCD. Um, so things have changed a lot. Um, I think the important thing um, in, in, from all of that is that in the, in the literature and in the research, there has been quite a shift in terms of our orientation to suffering, our understanding of human suffering. And in that, um, also an emphasis on building capacity and resilience, resilience in, in the care provider. Um, the, the, the fellowship that, that I had had I sent three pieces to it. I mean, the bulk of it was in the uh, Zen Center, the uh, Upaya Center in New Mexico. And I'll talk about that. That was a nine day uh, training, pro uh, 11 day training program, residential. Uh, and then uh, I went to UCLA and um, taught for a couple of days and met the people in the uh, Consciousness Research Center uh, in UCLA, which was very exciting. Um, and then went to visit the Zen Hospice in San Francisco. So there, it was very uh, kind of theory practice uh, driven. So kind of going from U Upaya from New Mexico, uh, which was largely experiential, um, and then to see what was happening in the lab, so to speak, in UCLA, uh, and then to see what was happening in practice in the Zen Hospice in, in San Francisco. So um, I, I hope to talk about some of that. Um, the um, Literature that people will know will uh, uh, suggest or, or uh, alludes to the fact that one of the greatest challenges in death and dying is simply being with that. And I guess over the years as a clinician and teacher and researcher, it is the issue that kept coming back to me um, that the difficulty with uh, death and dying um, is an emotional one. And that probably sounds terribly obvious to everyone in the room, um, but it took me a little while to understand that. I uh, then began to kind of have a look around and see what people were saying, or what were other people saying about this? Was this actually true? And um, 
there were uh, there were a couple of pieces I think that uh, that really fueled my uh, my kind of thinking and interest in the area. Um, uh, a journal article that kind of represents again a change in how we're understanding um, death and dying psychologically. Um, I think it's 2012, um, 2011. Um, and this is an article that kind of kicked off and in some way uh, really brought our attention to um, moving beyond the uh, uh, theories that we were very familiar with, with terror management and death denial. Uh, and they call, I think very articulately, they call for a positive psychology approach to death and dying. Um, the other, sorry, fr from that, I mean, some of what they say is that that covert and the, unconscious, the conscious that death anxiety, that if it's not addressed, may undermine our well-being and prevent us from fully engaging in life. And that if we keep on worrying about death to the extent that we are not free to live. <coughs> so really, they're calling for a very different level of engagement with death and dying. And that, in fact, when we confront and lean into, that it's at that point that we begin to live. Um, the other um, piece that, that fueled and uh, fired uh, the fellowship was uh, being with Don, uh, 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 written by uh, the, the person who delivered the training, uh, Joan Halifax. Um, I'd recommend both of if you're interested at all, I'd recommend both of those uh, pieces as a place to kind of think about. Um, to deny death is to deny life. That's uh, essentially the um, the mission, or the uh, you could kind of summarise in a way a lot, a lot of the training into that. That when we uh, psychologically and emotionally deny our own death, we're actually denying the life that's in front of us. Um, the the and the idea that if we actually take care of our own minds, that we take care of the whole world. It's that kind of Mary Oliver uh, idea that Mary Oliver's that beautiful poem that says we uh, we need to save the only life that we can. And that's our own life. Mm -hmm. um, so wrapped up in 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 in, in some of that. Um, Joan Halifax uh, is the uh, founder of Upaya and has been teaching the program uh, there for um, 20, I think when I was there it was its 25th anniversary. She's a Zen priest uh, who began her life as an anthropologist and as an anthropologist began to look at um, experiences of people uh, who died in, in emergency departments in, uh, in San Francisco and I became very curious. Um, about anthropologically what was going on uh, with the patient, the nurse, the doctor, the whole scene. Um, and she's been teaching for, for, for many years and researching for many years in this area uh, in, in all sorts of places. That's her. Um, mm. She, um, quite the lady. Um, nice friend. The, uh, yeah, 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 some good friends. Eh? <laughs> she, um, the, the program itself um, is a, 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 an attempt to integrate um, Eastern and, and Western uh, knowledge um, into dealing with death um, and essentially about the application of contemplative practices. Now, I kind of wonder, well, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, and I guess um, she uses the term contemplative practices to use to talk about um, some religious practices from the East and the West um, in um, building resilience uh, in the face of death and dying. Um, she, she describes this as the uh, antidote to uh, the American vision of a good death uh, that she describes as often life-denying, antiseptic, drugged up, tumor tangled and institutionalized. Um, the curriculum was developed in the 1970s and uh, has been has been taught uh, in, in lots and lots of places since uh, since 1970 since 1972. Um, this is the uh, Upaya uh, Zen Center. Um, it's uh, yeah, New Mexico, uh, way up in the mountains, uh, and and essentially, um, I mean, it's 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 desert, a very very stunning location. Um, the training um, covers uh, a lot of areas, uh, aims to uh, cover a lot of areas. There were 72 healthcare professionals on the program uh, for a nine-day residential program, um, mainly nurses and doctors. 
Um, I think there might have been another psychologist and a couple of psychotherapists, but the bulk uh, were nurses and doctors. Um, they uh, and not um, not necessarily uh, palliative or oncology nurses or doctors. There was quite a spectrum of people there. Um, as some of the issues that were covered, those ethical issues, the concept of, of community building. And she talks very clearly, uh, there's a very nice uh, TED Talks uh, piece with Joan Halifax yeah. where she talks about how we transform death by transforming our personal experience of that, our building capacity in the community and transform the institutions that care for people at the end of their lives. So the kind of three-pronged yeah. approach. Um, it's, a, it's a really yeah. uh, nice, uh, succinct clip. Um, I think uh, most importantly, if I was to be very honest and very frank about it, um, the program uh, uh, aimed at um, facilitating health and social care professions to confront their own mortality. So, um, and there was all that other stuff was done as well. Um, but using uh, contemplative practices in order to do that. So, um, there, there are, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know much about this actually at all, but there are these things called Tibetan bardos, apparently, which are uh, very ancient uh, mechanisms for confronting your own uh, death. So, um, without terrifying people, over the course of nine days, nine mornings, uh, we engaged in these practices, and that kind of, on about kind of day five or six, um, one of the practices, and I forget what it was called, but is um, um, a, a practice, a meditation practice, where um, we begin to think of ourselves, visualizing ourselves dying, and where would we be in 10 years' time, where would that be, and who would be there, and you know, all of those kinds of things. So I'm a real flavor of that. Um, and then, of course, it's, well, well, uh, okay, so in five years' time, where would you be in New York? So you know where this is going, okay? So then in a year's time, and then uh, if that were to happen right now. Um, so um, the, the intention, um, I guess, is, to, uh, is for the healthcare professional. B based on the idea that I mean, she, her, her hypothesis, uh, her belief or her hypothesis is that the quality of care that we give to people at the end of their lives is utterly dependent on how we have negotiated our own death anxiety. Okay. Um, and the extent of the, 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 the quality of care is, is dependent on that. So um, it was um, it was quite an intense experience, as you can imagine. And of course, it was full of lots of uh, uh, very chatty Americans who could, Californians who could talk forever about <laughs> their experience of death and dying. Um, the, uh, there were lots of very innovative uh, and uh, um, stimulating uh, uh, methods uh, of teaching on the program. Um, one of the things that they, they did constantly, so I mean it went from 7 a.m. until 9.30 p.m. right through. And uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that they constantly did, so before each session started there was a very brief kind of yoga um, practice. And uh, so they talked about how we manage our fatigue uh, by staying connected to the body. Um, and that when we disconnect from the body, that uh, we uh, it ends up in, a, in accumulated fatigue. And I have to say, after I was there for eleven days, after eleven days, I felt incredibly well. Just interesting, the most wonderful food as well. Actually, it was just <laughs> fantastic food. Uh, toasted, um, toasted quinoa for breakfast. Yeah, um, beautiful. Um, the uh, big emphasis that uh, is placed on, on, on the program, on the training, is on the role of compassion. And as uh, I'm sure you're all sick about hearing about compassion, um, I even uh, I saw some stuff recently where uh, compassion is now being adopted by uh, multinationals uh, in order to uh, to sell. So uh, we uh, I don't believe in the concept of compassion fatigue, but uh, when multinationals are using it, I think I begin to. Um, I think. Um, the, the, the piece at the top there by uh, uh, Feldman and, 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 and uh, Koiken, uh, two uh, key uh, leading researchers in the field of compassion, and uh, the second piece to that, that compassion is the acknowledgement that not all pain can be fixed or solved, but all suffering is made more approachable in a landscape of compassion. So it just connects, and the compassion piece connects 
to the kind of third wave intervention piece, so moving from behavior cognition to actually we need to change our orientation to suffering. Um, so there was, a, as I say, a lot of uh, emphasis placed on, on compassion and the development of compassion for um, the healthcare provider. Um, operationalized uh, through a model that uh, Halifax and the team there uh, have been doing uh, structured training in, uh, both there and another part of the world called GRACE. And um, very useful, and I found myself, I can kind of rarely get beyond the A, but I found myself today in, in a situation, um, you know, one of those really tricky emotional situations, a young guy, and all sorts of things going on. And um, so this uh, uh, acronym, um, is a practice that we, um, an intervention or an application of the practice that we uh, learned and practiced throughout uh, the time there. So uh, essentially uh, gathering attention. So placing a lot of emphasis on, on attention and attentional control. So this, um, they suggest, um, is a practice that can happen when we meet a patient. Um, so gathering our attention, knowing where our mind is, and, and recalling our intention, why am I here? Uh, and that, I'm not talking about a 50 minute psychotherapy session with the patient, but it might actually be uh, two minutes as you pass them on the corridor. Why am I here? So knowing why am I here right now? Um, and attuning to one's own emotional state and the emotional state of the patient, or the person in front of you, or your colleague. And um, I think really importantly, considering what will serve. Again, I found myself today sitting there with a, a young couple and uh, kind of talking away, and I found myself asking that question, okay, what's going, to what's going to help right now? What's going to move this right now? So considering what will serve. And uh, the final piece of that, the engaging and ending is really important. So uh, clearly we engage, and um, but most, as important, if not more importantly, is the concept of ending. So they, attempt, they, they, they place great emphasis uh, when we finish an encounter uh, with the patient uh, that we end that in some way. Psychologically, we end that in some way. <coughs> and that might be when we go to wash our hands. Um, but drawing on the idea that um, unless that interaction is in some way kind of book end, almost like the experience of accumulated fatigue, we carry that with us. Um, a very useful, um, a very useful model, I think. Yeah. The uh, kind of third piece uh, in to to and a, and a very small part of it. The bulk of it was in the, the in Ukiah, um, after teaching in UCLA. Uh, the third piece was the, visiting the Zen Hospice in in San Francisco, and uh, I was talking to a couple of people just outside having a cup of tea, and. Um, Someone said to me, God, you know, God must be great, and, you know, is it what it says on the tin, you know, is it, is it Zen? And I said, it's not at all, actually, it's like every hospice I've been in. Um, and that, for me, was a huge learning, because, uh, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes we have this kind of, kind of romantic um, idea out there that what we do is done somewhere else really well. And in my head, I kind of think, oh, it was probably, it's probably done really well in Zen hospice. And they have all of the, uh, uh, rows and smells and disagreements and all that. So it's very, it was very, very reassuring actually. And um, what is different, what is different is, uh, I, I believe, is their orientation to human suffering. That um, the acknowledgement that human suffering is part of life, uh, death, sickness, and old age is inevitable. So um, it's, um, I was going to say, it's subtle and um, it's very unspoken. Um, but very real, and um, so that's the di that was the distinction that that that, uh, that I I felt. In, uh, I'm jumping ahead of myself, um, and that's that's part of it. And uh, in the eighty early eighties, eighty seven, and as a response to the uh, AIDS epidemic uh, in in San Francisco, um, and um, I mean, obviously that that's changed uh, quite a bit over the over, over the years. Um, but around that time, where probably one of the only or few providers of care to people who were dying of AIDS at the time, mm -hmm. uh, people were very very concerned. I mean, it's kind of Ebola kind of you know that kind of fear of you know, some people will remember some of that. Um, its founder, um, yeah, since its inception, and. Um, 
the the uh, it it has it, it has grown. The uh, Zen Hospice project itself is very small. There are six beds um, in a regular well, quite a big uh, quite a big house uh, in this house, um, and it's uh, they call it a hospice project as opposed to a hospice because um, they uh, it's staffed by nurses. Um, but the patients, uh, healthcare providers, come in to them. Uh, insurance uh, providers come in to them. Um, they have a very active uh, volunteer uh, program in uh, the local uh, the state hospital um, as well. With um, I, I think there are over 100 volunteers uh, working uh, through through the hospice um, the hospice bed. The um, mission of the hospice is uh, rooted in, in Buddhism, as, as, as you know. Um, the current director, who's there about three years, it's a guy on the photograph there, um, says, um, says many things about that, but how that as, uh, essentially acts as a launching pad um, to providing a uh, different level and quality of care to people at the end of their lives. He says, uh, yeah, um, so I, I, I like that idea or what he said about providing the patients with the truth as we know it and to support them as they ponder that truth and not to abandon them. Um, I see it over and over again. In the end, the truth always helps them. We're sitting on something of a secret and we can help people in ways that healthcare alone cannot. And some of what he talked about in terms of that truth was the... Um, that, that, um, the reality of uh, of of, uh, of suffering and of and of death. I came across this, uh, you know, written by the um, Australian nurse who who, who had uh, nursed uh, palliative uh, terminal patients, and uh, she she recorded over seven or eight years their uh, their top regrets. And um, I just uh, liked the one in yellow in particular. Um, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Um, <laughs> The, um, as you people will know, the uh, Woody Allen one, nothing wrong with death, I just don't want to be there. Um, John Halifax has said to that that yes, but the tragic distortion is that when we avoid our death, we also avoid our lives. Thank you.